constructing supply and demand diagrams, analyzing taxes, and so on. Economists often implicitly assume that the markets for goods and services are well behaved in a number of ways. Specifically, economists usually assume that consumers can't get goods without paying the market price, and that consuming one unit of a good prevents others from consuming the same unit of that good. However, it's important to understand what happens when these assumptions aren't satisfied, since, in practice, goods that aren't well behaved in these ways do in fact exist. As a starting point for this analysis, let's develop a framework for categorizing goods and services according to the principles of excludability and rivalry in consumption. Excludability refers to the degree to which the consumption of a good or service is limited to paying customers. If a good is excludable, an individual can't consume the good without paying for it, and if a good is non-excludable, then an individual can consume the good without paying for it. Sometimes excludable goods are referred to as having high excludability, and non-excludable goods are referred to as having low excludability. For example, an iPad is an excludable good, since if I want to have my own iPad, I have to pay for it. On the other hand, a fireworks display is a non-excludable good, since it's really hard to make it so that only paying customers can see the fireworks. It's worth noting that some goods, such as the fireworks display, are non-excludable by design, but other goods could be non-excludable by choice. For example, most roads are not limited to paying customers, but they could be made excludable by installing toll booths. In the cases where goods are non-excludable by choice, being non-excludable is, well, for practical purposes, equivalent to setting a price of zero. Rivalry in consumption, or sometimes simply rivalry, refers to the degree to which one person consuming a unit of an item prevents others from consuming the same unit of that item. In other words, a rival good, or a good that has high rivalry in consumption, could only be fully consumed by one person, and a non-rival good, or a good that has low rivalry in consumption, can be fully consumed by multiple people at once. For example, the iPad mentioned before is rival or has high rivalry, since for most tasks at least, one person using the iPad prevents other people from using the same iPad. On the other hand, the fireworks display is non-rival or has low rivalry, since one person enjoying the fireworks display doesn't prevent another person from fully enjoying the same fireworks display. Goods that are non-rival can be thought of as having a marginal cost of zero, since it doesn't cost anything extra to provide the good for one extra person. Using the definitions of excludability and rivalry, we can categorize goods and services into four different buckets. Private goods, or our well-behaved goods from earlier, are both excludable and rival. Goods that are neither excludable nor rival are referred to as public goods. For example, national defense is the quintessential example of a public good since it's virtually impossible to limit national defense to paying customers, and it costs essentially nothing on the margin to provide national defense to one more person. It's important to keep in mind that while many public goods are in fact provided by government, public goods aren't called as such because they're provided by the government. Goods that are non-excludable but rival are called common resources, or common pool resources. For example, free clinics can be thought of as common resources, since they're not limited to paying customers, but one person using a service such as seeing a doctor makes it so other people have to wait in line and such. Goods that are excludable but non-rival are known as either club goods or natural monopolies. Specifically, club goods are one type of natural monopoly. One common example of a club good is a cable television provider, since service is restricted to paying customers, but the marginal cost of providing service to one more customer is virtually zero. These goods are referred to as natural monopolies because market forces usually make them a type of monopoly. But, as we'll see later, the specific features of natural monopolies make them different from regular monopolies from a regulation standpoint. Note 
in the diagram here that I use the labels high and low excludability rather than excludable and non-excludable, and the labels high and low rivalry and consumption rather than rival and non-rival. I did this to emphasize the idea that excludability and rivalry are not binary conditions, but instead there's a spectrum of behaviors that goods and services can exhibit in this regard. One last type of good is a congestible good. A congestible good is a good that sometimes looks like a public good, but then starts to look like a common resource as it gets crowded. For example, a road is likely a congestible good, since an empty road has low rivalry and consumption, since one person on an empty road doesn't prevent others from fully using the road. But a crowded road has high rivalry and consumption, since one person on a crowded road does, in fact, make it more difficult for others to use the road. We'll examine each of these types of goods in more detail, but as a general rule, lack of excludability represents a market failure where property rights are not well established. Therefore, there's a potential economic case to be made for government regulation or provision of such goods.